Long ago, in a mythical land, there ruled an evil sorceress named Babmorda. Fearing an ancient prophecy that said a baby would be born with the power to destroy her, the wicked queen ordered all pregnant women to be imprisoned. She locked them in the grim dungeon beneath Nokmar Castle and waited for news of the child's birth. Only then could she begin the ritual to undo the omen and end any opposition to her villainous reign forever. Far below the Queen's Tower, in a dark cell patrolled by Nokmar guards, a baby girl was born with a strange mark on her arm. The mother clasped the midwife's hand. Please help me! Again. They're going to kill her! Esna hesitated, then quickly bundled some rags in the shape of a baby and handed them to the mother. Oh, thank you, Esna. Then she hid the real child in her basket and hurried past the guards, escaping just as Bavmorda swooped into the mother's cell. Ah, I knew you'd be the one. You cannot stop the prophecy. This child will have no power over me. Start the ritual. Bavmorda grabbed the rags and ripped them apart. Baby! She pointed at her daughter, Sosha, and ordered the young warrior to track down the baby. Use the dogs. Bring her back to me alive. Outside Nokmar Castle, the ferocious death dogs pursued the midwife. Just as the dogs were about to attack her, she placed the baby in a raft of twigs and pushed it out into the river. Downstream, in a land of little people called Nelwins, two children found the baby. They showed it to their father, a farmer, and a sparring sorcerer named Willow Ufgood. Don't go near it. We don't know where it's been. But, Dad, it's a baby. It's not like us. No, it's not an Elwin. Looks like a Daikini baby. What's a Daikini? Daikinis are big, giants who live far away. Willow pulled his children away, and the baby whimpered. Can't we keep it, Dada? No. We'll push it downstream and forget we ever saw it. Suddenly, Willow heard his name called by Burglecunt, the village prefect. Willow dashed up to his plough, leaving his children with the baby. Afgood, this son paid your debts to me. Where did you get these seeds? Well, maybe I used magic. <laughs> You're no sorcerer, Afgood. You're a clown. I sell the clown seeds around here. Now tell me where you got them. My family's been gathering them in the forest since last fall. There's no law against that Mr. Burglecunt. Magic? You'll need magic to expect to get your plans done before the rains start. Burglecut stumped off, and Willow returned to the riverbank. He found his wife, Kaya, cradling the Daikini baby in her arms. Kaya! Oh, Willow! Good girl. Absolutely, under no condition whatsoever, is anyone in this family to fall in love with that baby. Smiling, Kaya stepped around Willow and headed home, still holding the baby. Hey, I will not be ignored! That night, Willow paced nervously as his wife bathed the child. Willow, do you think we should take her to the village council? No, no, they'll think it's a bad omen. There'll be a flood or a drought, and everyone will blame me for it. Willow Upgood brought around that daikini, didn't he? That's right, he's that lousy farmer too. Let's get him! Willow, calm down. <laughs> calm down? Kaya, tomorrow's my big day. Love, the High Aldwin hasn't picked a new apprentice in years. Tomorrow's going to be different. I just know he's going to pick me. The next day, Willow stood on the stage at the Nell Wind Festival performing magic tricks. And now, for my final amazing feat, I will make this entire pig disappear. Uh. Warpity Ban, Daru, Daru! Seconds later, it leapt out of a hidden pocket. <laughs> Embarrassed, Willow climbed off the stage. He made his way across the festival to join the other candidates. They nervously faced an old and bearded wise man, the High Aldwin. Magic is the bloodstream of the universe. Forget all you know, or think you know. All that you require is your intuition. Now. 
The power to control the world is in which finger? Each candidate gave an answer. Willow was the last hopeful to choose. He hesitated, then selected one of the remaining fingers. The high Aldwin pounded his staff. No apprentice this year! Willow bowed his head, then heard shrieking and looked up. A ferocious death dog tore through the village, ransacking hut after hut, dragging empty cribs and cradles into the open. As Willow ran to safety, Nelwyn warriors drove their spears through the beast, killing it. A villager picked up a broken crib. He was looking for somebody's baby. Willow raced home and grabbed the Daikini child, then ran to the council building where an angry crowd had assembled. Burlcut shook his fist. Silence! One beast we can kill, but there may be more. And you can be assured that he won't give up till they find what they're looking for. No, I He's right to say it! It's an open way for this. We must find the culprits and throw him in the pit! Yes! In the pit! In the pit! Hello! Hello, Afghan. Come forward. My children found this baby along by the river, Hyrule. This child is special. This child must be taken beyond the boundaries of our village, all the way across the great river to the Daikini Crossroads. But who do that? I will consult the bones. The bones have spoken. Willow off good. The safety of this village depends upon you. Raise the bones! Raise, Raise the bones! But you will need help. All this expedition needs is a leader. And according to the bones, that leader is you, Virgil Cut. The next day, as a small band of Nelwins prepared to set off, the High Aldwin pulled Willow aside. When I held up my fingers, what was your first impulse? Well, it was stupid. Just tell me. You took like my own finger. Ah, that was the correct answer. You lack faith in yourself more than anyone in the village. You have the potential to be a great sorcerer. Now, when you're out there, listen to your own heart. These will protect you. Ink horns. They're magic. Anything you throw them at turns to stone. Willow nodded gratefully and marched off with the others. Far away in Nokmar Castle, Sorsha raced into the Queen's Tower empty-handed. Suddenly, a huge, sinister figure wearing a death's head mask appeared in the doorway. General Kale, at last. My Queen, I have destroyed the castle at Galadorn. Well done. But now I have another task for you. Help my daughter to find that tiny, helpless baby that continues somehow to elude her. The baby of the prophecy, the one that would destroy you. I need that baby alive. I must perform the ritual that will exile the child's spirit into oblivion. Find her. Sorsha and Kale hurried out. One of Bavmorda's druids approached the queen. One day, I fear, your daughter will betray you. I trust her loyalty more than I trust yours. Meanwhile, the Nelwins trekked across vast, fantastic terrain to reach the crossroads. When they arrived, Willow gazed down the deserted road, then up at a rag-filled cage dangling from a scaffold above him. Suddenly, a large arm reached out and yanked Willow into the air. Ah, uh, Give me some water, Peck. Uh, or you'll die. Do you understand? <laughs> Willow dropped to the ground and snatched up the baby. As the little people huddled in fear, Burglecott stared at the long-haired, disheveled prisoner. It's Daikini. We're in luck. We can't give it to him. Somebody put him there for a reason. We gotta give that baby to somebody. I'm somebody. Let me out of here. I'll take care of the baby. I trust him completely. But he tried to strangle me. I go home. No, Burglecut. We should wait. Are you challenging my authority? As far as this baby's concerned, yes. Fine. You stay here alone. We're going. 
Burgle Cut stumped off with the other Nelwins, leaving Willow alone with the Daikini. I don't think I introduced myself. My name is Mad Mardigan. I suppose you're a warrior. I am the greatest swordsman that ever lived. Say, uh, can I have some of that water? Yeah. Thanks, friend. What's that? About a hundred horses, five or six wagons, and about a thousand fools. An enormous army thundered through the crossroads. Amidst the din and dust, Willow attempted to draw the attention of an officer, a muscular daikini named Eric Thobear. Excuse me, sir. We found one of your babies in our village. Will you please take care of her? Going into battle, little ones. Find a woman to take care of her. You thought you were a woman, Eric? Well... <laughs> Mad Mardigan! I always knew you'd end up in a crow's cage. Well, at least I'm not down there herding sheep. What are you doing this far north? The Nakma army destroyed Galadorn. That Mortis troops are crushing everything inside. Well, come on, let me out of here, Eric. Give me a sword. I'll win this war for you. Mad Mardigan, you serve no one. Remember? Sit in your coffin and rot. Eric spurred his horse and galloped off. Yeah. Wait, Eric! Yeah. As Willow peered down the road, hoping another daikini would appear, Mad Martigan fixed his gaze on the Nelwyn. Nobody's gonna take care of that baby. You know why? Nobody cares. Except me. Let me take care of that baby. I'll look after her like she was my own. Willow surveyed the desolate landscape and thought about his wife and children far away in the Nelwyn village. Using his knife, he hacked open the cage. You gotta promise to feed her and keep her clean. Absolutely. Here are changing rags and her milk bladder. Any milk in there? It's for her. I wouldn't steal from a baby. You worry too much, Peck. It's Willow. I mean Willow. Willow, you've done the right thing. Willow kissed the baby goodbye, and he and Mad Martigan took off in different directions. Before long, Willow looked up and saw an eagle flying toward him. On its back was a tiny creature called a brownie, and in its claws, the baby. Stop, wait, come back! Willow dashed into the woods after the bird and fell headlong into a deep, dark pit. While he was unconscious, his wrists and feet were bound with rope by a bunch of giggling, tattooed brownies. Willow awoke, and the eagle's rider strutted up to him. What's going on? Shut up or I'll break your nose! You are mine to toy with. Forward! Willow thrashed at his ropes as the brownies towed him deeper into the forest. Suddenly, a light pulsated behind the trees. Release the Nelwyn. Uh -oh. Willow saw the baby in a bassinet, and as he ran to her, a diaphanous, sylph-like fairy materialized out of the glowing light. Welcome to my kingdom. I am so happy to meet you, Willow of Good. How do you know my name? Elora Dannon told me. But she's just a baby. Elora Dannon has chosen you to be her guardian. Me? She likes you. <laughs> Take my wand, the sorceress Finrazel. She will guide you and Elora Dannon to the kingdom of Tirazlin. You need a warrior for a job like this. I'm a nobody. I'm short, even for Nelwyn. Elora Dannon must survive. She must fulfill her destiny and bring about the downfall of Queen Bavmorda, whose powers are growing like an evil plague. Unless she is stopped, Bavmorda will control the lives of your village. Your children, everyone. All creatures of good heart need your help, Willow. The choice is yours. Willow nodded grimly, then picked up the baby. He hurried through the forest, guided by the brownies, Frangine, and Rule. How long will it take to find this Roselle? Not long. She's been exiled to an island just over those hills. She's what? Exiled by the evil queen, Bavmorda. <laughs> oh, you fool, he does not need to know everything. I didn't tell him everything. You told him enough. What do you mean? What are you saying, mysterious island? This way. No, 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 I don't think so. All right, then this way. Are you sure you know where you're going? Of course. With us as your guides, no harm will befall you. Soon, Willow spied a tavern and ran inside to find milk for Elora. 
There he saw a familiar face. It was Mad Martin, disguised as a woman. Not you! Where'd you come from? I knew I shouldn't have trusted you. Suddenly, Knockmar soldiers burst through the door. <laughs> Thinking quickly, Mad Martin grabbed the baby from Willow and faced the Knockmar leader, a young woman covered in armor. You! Are you the mother of that child? Yes, yes, I am. Let me see it. Willow jumped in front of Mad Martigan. No, don't let her. I gave you an order, woman! Sorsha grabbed for Elora, and Mad Martigan elbowed her away, <laughs> knocking her off balance. She ripped off her helmet, and long red hair tumbled over her shoulders. You're, you're beautiful. And you're very strong. Thank you. Sorsha squinted suspiciously at Mad Martigan. You're no woman. Mad Martin dashed across the room and leaped out of the window, followed by Willow and the Brownies. After them! The soldiers tumbled downstairs as Mad Martigan and Willow dropped into a wagon beneath the window. Mad Martigan seized the reins and sped off, bouncing over the muddy road. Mad Martigan, stop! You're gonna get us killed! A Nokmar horseman galloped up and jumped into the wagon. Struggling to defend himself, Mad Martin grabbed a wooden stake off the wagon's side and smashed the minion to the ground. He urged the horses forward, and soon Mad Martin had outrun the troops. Now we stop, Peck. Mad Martin, you never, ever drive that fast with an infant. I just saved that infant's life. They leaped to the ground, and Mad Martin sent the wagon rattling down the road. You better clear out, Willow, before those troops come back. Mad Mardigan, wait! Go home, Willow. It's a dangerous world. Yeah, and that's why we need your help. My help? Huh. What do you need my help for? You're a sorcerer. You're a great warrior and a swordsman. And you're ten times bigger than I am, stupid! Are you trying to make my life more difficult than it already is? Look, I'm sorry I got angry. We wouldn't have escaped without you. Well, <clears throat> don't expect me to help you again. Good! Then we go that way, to the lake! Oh, no! That's the way I'm going. All right, all right, you can follow me as far as the lake. But that's it. Meanwhile, in Nakmar, the fiendish queen Bavmorda faced her general. Kale, have you found the child? The search goes on, my queen. Why, with my powers, with the strength of my great army, can you not find one little child? We look even now. It won't be long. Find the child. Find the child! Time is running out. Far away, beside a dwindling campfire, Mad Martigan watched Willow check on the dozing baby. Good night. She is kind of cute when she's quiet. She's really a princess. Really? And you're a great sorcerer. And I'm the king of Kashmir. Go to sleep, Willow. The next day, they approached a lake. As they drew near, Willow saw an island. We made it. Well, looks like I got you here. You? What did you do? All you did was hang around and eat our eggs, huh? I found a boat. We're all set. Good. Man Mardigan. What? Thanks. As the Daikini wandered off, Willow gazed apprehensively across the wind-whipped water. The brownies drew closer. It's all right, Elora. Go to sleep. Nobody will find you here. I'll be back with Finrazel very soon. We will guard her with our meager lives. Willow rode to the island and jumped ashore. A little possum scurried down a tree, hissing at him. Get back! Who are you? I'm Willow Offgood. I've come to find the great sorceress, Finn Rizel. That's me! I'm Rizel. This can't be right. One of Bavmorda's spells transformed me. Well, this wand is for you. It's from Sherlindria. Then the prophecy is true. The princess has been born. Take me to her. Willow took Rizel across the lake. The brownies wrinkled their noses when they saw the possum. That's Rizel. Oh, no, I, I expected something more grand, the less, uh, fuzzy. Fuzzy. You must use the bond. Turn me back into my human form. What do I do? 
You mean you're not a sorcerer? Yes. Sora, I'm a farmer, but I do know a few tricks. Tricks? To literally say you? You must learn real magic. Horses! Horses! Several Nakmar soldiers rode up with a prisoner. It was Mad Martigan. Sorry about this, Peck. A soldier pushed Mad Martigan off his horse, <gasps> then reached for a Laura. No! Give her back! A soldier grabbed the baby as Sorsha and her troops galloped up. They tossed Razel into a cage, then chained Mad Martigan and Willow to a wagon. The brownies hid, watching the caravan head for the forbidding snow-covered mountains. We'll never keep up with those horses! Are you suggesting we go home? Now nah, this is more fun. Meanwhile, Willow and Mad Martigan struggled along behind the wagon containing Roselle. It doesn't sound good. Hurry! Come to the jet, I told you! Tana, Luatha, I can't remember the middle part. Look for! That is the word that pleads for change. Look for. Sorsha rode up alongside the prisoners patrolling her troops. She caught Mad Martigan staring up at her. What are you staring at? Your leg. I'd like to break it. You may find that difficult, slave, while I'm up here and you're down there. Sorsha spurred her horse and galloped off. I hate that woman. The convoy forged deeper into the icy mountains. As they neared their destination, pinpoints of light flared into ominous, flickering campfires. Mad Martigan saw a sinister figure ride out to meet them. Sorcerer showed him the baby. You're late. I found it, Kay. The soldier shoved Mad Martigan and Willow into a jail cell and hung Rizel's cage nearby. After they left, Willow knelt over a bowl containing a muddy mixture of snow and dirt. Hither, Woha, Bern, Daru, Bordak, Belenoct. That's magic? It smells terrible. It's the life spark. It forms after... Well, it stinks. This whole thing stinks. Ignore him, Willow. He's a fool. Willow stirred the concoction with Shalindria's wand. Willow, you must transform me to my human self. Get me down. Willow tried to reach her cage with a stick but couldn't stretch far enough. Mad Martigan reluctantly poked the cage and it crashed to the ground, freeing Roselle. Why don't you help me get out of here instead of chattering with that muskrat? Muskrat! When I change back to my former self, I will crush this army and take Alora Dannon to Tirasleen, where she will be safe. Ow! What you bite me for? You need three drops of your blood to put in the potion. Well, you could have warned me. Willow applied the blood, smearing it on the gnarled branch. For beginners, there's some pain, but don't let anything break your concentration. Suddenly, the brownies bounced into the cell. Hello, everybody! We have arrived! You are saved! Shh! Don't interrupt! Hither, Green and Ben, Clyde Abluninocht. Concentrate, Willow. Hither, Green and Ben, Clyde Abluninocht. Hither, Green and Ben, Clyde Abluninocht. You're losing me! Roselle's body contorted, and her fur stiffened into the shiny, black feathers of a raven. Willow dropped the wand and rubbed his aching wrist. Farmers, chilling their sins, me, farmers. Sir Nelwyn really butchered that one. I'm sorry, Roselle. You are out? Easy, we can pick the lock. Come on. The brownies attempted to pry open the lock with their tiny spears, and Mad Martigan leaned closer. No, 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 like this. I know what I'm doing. It's my spear. Leave it alone. Let me do it. You leave that alone, you stupid fat dikini! Frangine whacked Mad Martigan across the nose with his hip pouch. Wow. And a powdery love potion called Dust of Broken Heart flew into his face. The brownies clicked open the lock and Mad Martigan stumbled out of the cell. Willow yanked him behind the tent where Sorsha and the baby slept. Only one of us should go in there. I've had experience in this sort of thing. I know what I'm doing. As Willow stood guard, Mad Martigan crept inside and tiptoed past Sorsha's bed. He noticed how beautiful she looked in her soft nightdress and bent to kiss her, uh -oh. unaware that he was under the spell of the magic dust. Oh, Sorsha. No. 
wake from this hateful sleep, it deprives me of your beauty. The beauty of your eyes. Startled awake, Sorsha drew a dagger and held it against Mad Martigan's throat. The lovesick Mad Martigan ignored the blade and continued to babble as Willow sneaked into the tent, creeping toward the baby. You are my sun, my moon, my starlit sky. Without you, I dwell in darkness. I love you. What are you doing here? Your power has enchanted me. I stand helpless against it. Come to me now, tonight. Let me worship you in my arms. Get away from me. I love you. Stop saying that. Can I stop the beating of my heart? It pounds like never before. Out of fear. Out of love. I can stop it. I'll kill you. Death next to love is a trivial thing. Your touch is worth a hundred thousand deaths. Trembling, Sorsha leaned toward him. Just as she was about to receive Mad Martigan's kiss, Kale ripped open the canvas. What goes on here? The general grabbed Willow and the baby and tossed them under some straw. <laughs> Sorsha saw the empty crib and backed away from Mad Martigan. She lunged at Mad Martigan, and he rolled backward, kicking the dagger out of her hand. He grabbed her sword and slashed his way out of the tent, where a band of Nokmar soldiers waited. Fending them off, he glimpsed Willow with a baby and pointed to a shield skidding across the ice. Get on that shield! As arrows rained around them, Mad Martigan leaped beside Willow, and they slid down the mountainside. Mad Martigan called back to Sorsha. Sorsha! After them! The makeshift sled bounced over snowdrifts and zigzagged between trees, finally crashing into a village at the bottom. They emerged from the snow unscathed. And Morrigan. What happened up there? You started spouting poetry. Poetry? Yeah. I love you, Sorsha. I worship you, Sorsha. You almost got us killed! I love you, Sorsha. I don't love her. She kicked me in the face. I hate her. Do I? Suddenly, Kale and twenty horsemen charged toward him. A sympathetic villager hurried them into a dark cellar crowded with other fugitives. Mad Martigan recognized a familiar shape and slammed him against the wall. You left me to die, Eric. I probably saved your life. We were slaughtered and I lost a lot of... Shh, quiet. Sorsha kicked open the door to their hiding place and descended the steps. As she squinted into the darkness, Mad Martigan grabbed her and held a knife to her throat. He gripped his hostage and led Willow and the rebels past the Nokmar soldiers. Back! Back! Scum. You'll never defeat us! Give up the baby! Eric gazed at Alora Dannon. What does that want with this baby anyway? She's a princess. We're taking her to Tara's Lean. Tara's Lean? Even if you could find it, Peck, she's right. You'd never get past the Nakwa army. There's an even bigger army at Tyr's Lean. If we can just get there. I've lost more than half my men fighting Bad Morda. Now you and this pack are gonna take her on? You always told me you served no one, Matt Mardigan. Since when are you a crusader? He's not gonna help you, Peck. He's a worthless thief. I'm not a thief, Eric. He's not a thief, are you? Mad Mardigan paused, then faced the rebel soldier. I served the Nilwyn, Eric. You wanna come with us? They'll never make it, Mad Martigan. And once again, we say goodbye. Mad Martigan helped Willow and the baby onto one horse, then hauled Sorsha up onto another. She screamed, Over and her soldiers drew their bows. Weapons down where she's dead! They galloped off into yeah. the snow, with Rozelle flying above them. This way! This way! At the crow flies, you fools! Edging into a narrow canyon, Mad Martigan and Sorsha trailed behind Willow. Did I really say those things last night in your tent? You said you loved me. I don't remember that. You lied to me. No, I... I just wasn't myself last night. I suppose my power enchanted you and you were helpless against it. Sort of. Then what? It went away. Went away? I dwell in darkness without you and it went away? Yeah. She elbowed him hard and struggled free. He leaped off his horse and tackled her in a muddy street. They stared into each other's eyes. Hurry! Kale's coming! Mad Martigan jumped up and dragged Sorsha, kicking and scratching to his horse. Suddenly, she punched him and ran. Mad Martigan dashed after her. Mad Martigan, come on! They're coming! Away! 
Leaving Sorsha behind, Mad Martigan mounted his horse and took off after Willow. They galloped into a valley carpeted with flowers. Before them stood a magnificent castle. Razelle soared over the castle wall, and Mad Martigan and Willow rushed into the courtyard, unprepared for the eerie scene awaiting them. The people of Tia Aslin were frozen inside chunks of crystal, the victims of Babmorda's curse. Why did I listen to you, Peck? Everything will be all right once we get to Tia Aslin. The only army around here is the one that's about to ride across this valley and wipe us out! But Cheryl Indria said we'd be safe here. Safe? Look at these people. This place is cursed, Peck. This is the work of Van Morda! Uh, Willow? Uh, the wand? Are you sure? Transform me? I can't do it. I'm just not a sorcerer. But you can be, speak, and be one with the words. He tried to concentrate but was distracted by the battle cry of the approaching Nakmar army. This time, Razelle turned into a goat. Willow! You idiot! Razelle? Inside the castle, Mad Martigan discovered a golden suit of armor. He put it on and raced outside. Willow! On the catapult up there! Willow hid Elora Dannon and crossed a bridge in search of the catapult stone. On the other side, a hideous hairy troll blocked his way. <laughs> It grabbed Willow and dangled him in front of its mouth. Willow, use the wand! Willow whipped out Shalindria's wand and whacked the troll on the head. Bellinart, take that troll! The troll disintegrated into a blob of jiggling jelly. Willow kicked it into the moat below, hoping no one would notice his latest mistake. The moat began to bubble and fizz. Suddenly, the Nakmar army arrived, cornering Mad Martigan below. To Nakmar! Get him! Just when he seemed outnumbered, a huge two-headed monster rose out of the moat. Breathing fire, it roared at the soldiers and sent them fleeing. Then it spotted Willow. Ah! Mad help! Mad Martigan jumped onto one head and pierced its skull with his sword. The monster's throat filled up with gas and exploded sending Mad Martigan reeling backward into a nest of Nokmar soldiers. Sorsha looked on and saw the valiant warrior Mad Martigan fight so hard and so bravely for the life of this child and her Nelwyn protector. And suddenly, she could take no more. Seeing Mad Martigan trapped on the ground, she raced to his side and pulled him into her arms. Behind them, Kale emerged from the castle with the Lord of Dannon in his clutches. Abruptly, he raced off toward Nakma. Mad Martigan looked around. Willow! The Nelwyn staggered out of the castle, wounded. Elora's gone! Willow, they've taken up. There were too many of them. Let's ride. Mad Martigan scooped him up and motioned for Razelle to follow them. Ah! With Sorsha alongside, they rode out of Tyr as lead. There, Eric Philbert appeared with the rebel troops. They pursued Kale and his army to Nakmar Castle. The drawbridge was shut tight. We need towers and a battering ram. Break out the tents. Main camp. Main camp. <laughs> we'll assault at first light. Pacing inside her tower, Queen Bavmorda admitted General Kale. Where's Sorsha? She has turned against the Your Highness. Against me. <laughs> Prepare for the ritual! Bavmorda's druids took the terrified baby, and the queen rushed to the castle wall, where she could look down on the army that Eric and Mad Martigan had assembled. <laughs> she cackled fiendishly, and Rizelle, still in the shape of a goat, butted Willow into a tent. Willow, quick! Hide. Use the shelter charm to protect yourself! Why? Just do it! Outside, Mad Martigan faced the Queen. We've come for Alora Dannon. You dare to challenge me? You're not warriors. 
your pigs. Thoramunda! You're all pigs! 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 Mother, no! Along with the rebel soldiers, Sorsha's body expanded and contorted into the shape of a pig. Soon the mountainside was filled with the fleshy animals pushing against each other. Babmorda returned to her tower and hailed her druids. Begin the ritual! This baby will not live to destroy me. The queen glared up toward a large circular hole in the roof. Come thunder! Come lightning! Touch this altar with your powers! Outside, Willow crept from the tent. Seeing the mass of grunting pigs, he turned to Razel. We come all this way and now Elora Dannon's gonna die. No, we can still defeat Bemorda. She's too powerful, Razel. Transform me and I will destroy her. Willow drew a hexagram around Razel and began to chant. Elements of eternity, above and below. Balance of essence, fire begets snow. Razel's transformation began. Willow struggled to retain his concentration and strength. Zotwa Danalora, Duwatha Danu, Tuwatha Tuwatha, Snox Danu, Lothlaw Danalora, Duwatha Danu, Tuwatha Tuwatha, Snox Danu. Razel continued to change, first into a partly grotesque creature, then a deer, and finally, an elderly, once beautiful woman. Willow, we have work to do. Give me the wand. We must undo that water sorcery. Using her magic, Razelle turned the pigs back into warriors. With Mad Martigan and Sorcia beside him, Eric gloomily eyed the Queen's Tower. We can't get inside. Elora Dannon will die. No! She cannot transform you again. My spell is protecting this camp. But can you imagine get us inside the fortress? Razelle shook her head. We can't do it. Wait! Back home in my village, we have a lot of gophers. Willow, this is war, not agriculture. I know, I know. But I have an idea how to get inside the castle. At dawn, with one more ghastly ritual for Bavmorda to perform, Willow and Razelle stood alone outside the fortress, surrounded by empty tents. They shouted up to Kale. We call upon you to surrender! We are all powerful sorcerers. Give us the baby, or we'll destroy you! <laughs> Roaring with laughter, Kale ordered his men to kill them. Kill them! The drawbridge dropped. Willow trembled and raised a spear with two hands. Patience, Willow. Courage, Willow. Then, as the soldiers approached them, Willow smashed his spear on a war drum. Suddenly, the entire landscape came to life. Rebel soldiers sprung from the pits and trenches where they'd been hiding. They stormed the castle while Sorsha led Razelle and Willow inside. Willow stood watch on the stairway while Sorsha and Razelle climbed the corkscrew steps to the tower. There they confronted the queen, her face grotesquely transfigured by the ritual. Beside her were two druid guards. Mother! I... Traitor child, I must despise you now. She waved her hand and the druids attacked. Ah! Sorsha killed them both, then rushed toward Elora Dannon, who lay under a death-like spell on the copper altar. I won't let you kill that child. Away! About to... Draw! Lightning exploded overhead. Babmorda used her magic to trap Sorsha in a powerful energy force. The queen levitated her daughter toward a wall of spikes. And just as Sorsha was about to be impaled, another force stopped her. Your powers have gained in strength, Brazil. I have Shalindria's wand, Babmorda. Elora Dannon will be queen. They clashed in a vicious tug of war, using their powers to pitch fireballs across the room. 
As they battle, Willow abandoned his safe post on the stairway and crept into the tower. He inched toward the baby, dodging sparks and flying objects. Just as he grabbed the baby, that murder choked Razelle, and the sorceress slumped to the floor. The queen noticed the empty altar and slammed the door shut, trapping Willow inside. Who are you? I'm Willow Uthgood. I'm a great sorcerer. <laughs> Greater than Rizel. Greater than you, even. I'm the greatest sorcerer. Willow dug into his pocket and tossed one of the High Aldwin's magic acorns at Bav Morda. Her hand cut out and she caught it, crushing it in her fingers. Is that the extent of your powers, little one? Now you will watch me draw upon the power of the universe to send that child into the netherworld. Now place it on the altar. <laughs> no. No? You stupid hag. With my magic, I'll send her into the... into a... <laughs> You're no sorcerer. Into a realm where evil cannot touch her. Impossible. There's no such place. Willow whipped his cape around and the baby disappeared. Impossible! Enrage backed up and knocked over a sorcery bowl on the edge of the altar. Fluid spilled and collected in a pool at her feet. She screamed and raised her wand as the sky brightened with lightning. A bolt of lightning shot in through the ceiling and struck her. The evil queen burst into flame, shriveling into a pile of ash. Across the room, Razelle began to revive. Willow, where's the baby? He opened his cloak so Razelle could see the sleeping baby tucked inside. <laughs> it was just my old disappearing egg trick. <laughs> Elora Dannon's eyes opened and sunlight flooded the tower. <laughs> the next day, the freed court of Tir Aslin joined the triumphant rebels to bid Willow goodbye. Sorsha held Princess Elora in her arms and Mad Mardigan stood proudly beside them. Rizelle appeared dressed in druid robes Willow Afgood, receive this book of magic. You are on your way to becoming a great sorcerer. Everyone applauded as Willow humbly accepted the gift. Sorsha and Mad Martigan brought the baby forward. Willow gazed at the child, then leaned down and kissed her. <laughs> Goodbye, Laura Dannon. Mad Martigan lifted Willow onto the back of a white pony and warmly shook his hand. Willow rode across the lush valley, headed for home. In the Nailwyn village, the people saw Willow coming. They swarmed around him, wild with excitement. Willow! Willow! Kaya! He jumped off his pony and ran to embrace his wife. His children leaped on him, hugging him tightly. Before his family, in front of the Nailwyn villagers, in view of the venerable High Aldwyn, Willow plucked an apple from his saddlebag and tossed it into the air. It burst into the shape of a bird and flew off into the clouds. The people raised their voices in salute to Willow, the only sorcerer who could have saved Delora Dannon, and the mythical, magical world they inhabited. From the set of Willow, executive producer George Lucas. Well, I'm interested in fantasy, and in order to make fantasy work, you have to create a, a kind of immaculate reality that exists for the moment of the movie. And uh, without that, the fantasy won't work. You know, if it, if it seems phony or unreal or uh, doesn't have human dimension, then it won't, you know, it just won't work for the audience. And so that's obviously a very integral part of creating these, these kinds of movies, the fantasy movies. 
Special effects never make a movie. I don't make special effects movies. I make movies about people, and in order to tell a story, I have to use special effects in order to create the environments. Usually these special effects are, there's more or less in any one movie, but the film isn't about special effects. Uh, I think in most of these movies, you don't realize that there are special effects. Obviously, when you have dragons and fairies and brownies, there has to be something involved. Uh, or you actually have to believe in these things. Director Ron Howard. Well, you know, it's, it's one of those incredible things. You never think that there are nine-inch people until you start asking around. And then they start literally coming out of the woodwork. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we put ads in the paper, and that didn't really work. We, uh, we, we, we had disc jockeys, you know, asking about it. And, uh, and finally, we made, a, we made a breakthrough in Wichita, Kansas. And see, these, these people kind of, they, they keep to themselves. Uh, I think they have to. I mean, it's probably been a pretty rough road for them. Uh, I didn't get into those kind of discussions with these guys, but you can just tell working with them that it hasn't been easy. Uh, but this is a good opportunity for them. And uh, we interviewed about 600, 600 guys. And we found these, these, these two fellows. And they said, I don't know, they said there are probably somewhere between 75 and 100,000 people who are 11 inches tall or shorter. And uh, as I said, we, you know, we saw a few hundred. But, but uh, uh, not all of them, well, not all of them are kind of relaxed enough, loose enough to come in and be important characters in a movie. Uh, so. I think that, that uh, these two guys were, were kind of a find, and we were lucky to get them. Right? This, this movie's going to wind up taking well over two years of, of really complete commitment and, and, uh, and focused time. And there, there have been a lot of little payoffs along the way. It's been real hard, but it's, it's exciting for me so directing my first battle scene with a lot of guys on horses and people sword fighting and, and, and having it all come together and, and look terrific and then go to the dailies and see that, you know, it's, it's kind of like one of those movies that, that, uh, that you've always loved. Uh, well, that's a payoff. It's, uh, it's a payoff to see uh, Warwick Davis, who's, you know, 17 or 18 years old, really in his first big lead role. Uh, do a great job, and 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 throughout the course of three or four months that we were shooting every day, to see him grow and 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 become a really good actor, uh, that's that's really exciting. But probably for me, the the big payoff is 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 always when uh, when you show it to a real audience and it's finished, and uh, uh, if they like it. Then, if you entertained them, uh, then then you did what you set out to do a long time ago, and and, and uh, uh, so that's 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 where all my energy is. That's what all my energy is focused on is, is trying to get this movie to that point. And I got a lot of help, uh, and uh, and and we all want the same thing. I I also hope that that Willa works on the idea that that one person can make a difference if they're passionate enough and care enough about something that's important. Lead actor, Warwick Davis. Um, well, at the beginning, when I got the script, it didn't seem there was that much action in it. When I read the script, I thought, oh, this, is, this is pretty easy. <laughs> but then as it's gone along, like the next day, they've told me what I'm going to be doing. And I thought, oh dear, <laughs> you know, as I've gone along, I've realized what's going to be happening. I didn't know at the beginning. The worst, the worst day of filming, I think, was the Pinewood Tang in England. Because um, we did this, it was about three day shoot in this tank. And um, I was put out in the middle in a small boat with a hole in it. Um, they started wave machines, which made about three foot waves, um, tip tanks, which are tanks. Uh, with about a ton of water in that tip down the chute and make splash off waves like that. Um, we had big propellers, off aeroplane propellers, about 10 of those <laughs> blasting with hoses in front, blasting water at me. Uh, it was really bad. Uh, did three days of that and then I was called back for reshoots <laughs> the day after that. So. 
Well, I've got a phobia of horses, really. I, I really don't like because they're so big as well compared to me. I mean, stand there and they're way up there. And um, I went and had riding lessons the previous to my starting making the film. They sent me off for riding lessons. I started on this small horse about, I don't know, how high was it about? 11 hands high or something, really short little white one. So I was riding around on that, I thought this is easy. Then they gradually progressed me up onto about a 15 hand horse in the end. So I was riding this big black. In New Zealand, I was riding this big black X race horse out there. But it wasn't, it was a really sort of placid horse. That one. It was great fun though. In New Zealand, we did a lot of the sledging stuff and they brought in an expert skier who's done many films of, with involving actors and skiing and sledging and things. Um, the sequence starts with me jumping on a, an old shield, you see, that's what we go down on. Then Man Martigan jumps on behind and we go sledging off. Um, they had a camera, they did various rigs for this, they had a camera strapped to the front of the sled and a skier towing it down a hill. And this one shot we did, I was sitting on the top of the hill there waiting to do the shot. Started the camera, the, um, the skier started skiing down the hill and it was a nice shallow gradient, so I was sitting there just acting away, this is easy. And suddenly it dropped away. It's this really steep slope. And then the acting went and I was just real fear then, <laughs> down this drop. And then we ended up on the frozen lake at the bottom. And I had to do that about 12 times. <laughs> I was a nervous wreck at the end of it, it was so scary. Uh, the Cheryl Indria scene, I had to imagine this figure floating around above me. And when we actually shot the scene, they had a crane with a, it's like a really a dis the lights you find at a disco revolving drum on it, just floating around above me. So I was sort of looking at that, just to get the effect on my face that was, but I used that to look at, and just imagine that it was a sort of figure there. And then they had somebody just reading the off lines, her lines to me, so. Special effects supervisor, Dennis Muran. Right now we're creating behind me the uh, creation of this uh, Shalindria fairy queen that appears uh, in Willow in the fairy forest sequence. She's sort of a, a haunting figure. She's sort of a, a, uh, a gaseous creature that you could say occasionally appears when necessary in the forest. So she can, she's a little bit transparent. Because of being transparent, we're shooting her against a black background and we'll then double exposure into uh, the forest background to make her look as though she's actually in there with Willow. Because she's shot separately uh, against the black, we're photographing her greatly, greatly overexposed. So she's practically like you're looking into the sun. She's this bright, bright light. And then we're shooting her in slow motion, so she moves very fluid and magically. And then her costume is very lightweight silks that are being blown by fans hidden all around her that are blowing the costume up and making her uh, appear again like she's sort of like this gaseous figure floating above the forest. Then we're gonna, once we have this film, which we're shooting right now, we'll then go and add some additional effects to it to make it look even more gaseous and magical.